Tom Walker Thank you. brunch afterwards. How many of you enjoyed that on uh, Easter? It, it, it was great. Uh, when uh, I get up on Sunday morning, I usually just start drinking a little coffee. Don't feel much like eating. Uh, I'm always afraid if I eat too big of a breakfast, I might fall asleep during one of my own sermons. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you're with us here. <laughs> uh, but uh, by, so by the time a couple services are, are finished, man, I'm really ready for something. And uh, I've been reminded all week long, uh, in my parish in Sun City, Arizona, we had just hundreds of snowbirds that would come down, and some of them really had great senses of humor. We had an 8.30 and an 11 o'clock service, and one of the North Dakota farmers who just thought it was so cool in the middle of winter to wear his Bermuda shorts to church, because <laughs> he had grown up in these harsh winters. He, he was just full of life, and he had the greatest sense of humor, and after our 8.30 service, every Sunday, He'd get a twinkle in his eyes, he'd come by and we'd be shaking hands and he'd say, Pastor Mark, you want to go to brunch with us? We're going right now. <laughs> he knew darn well I had another service to do. <laughs> and he'd chuckle as he'd walk off. <laughs> the, the first time it was really kind of kind of cute and funny, but he'd do it every Sunday. <laughs> and after about the first two, three weeks, I thought, you know, he is pretty old. He probably just doesn't remember he's doing this, but he knew exactly what he was doing. Well, after about five or six weeks of this, I thought, you know, I'm the senior pastor. I have five other pastors at this church. I'm going to assign one of the other pastors to take the 11 o'clock service. And if Chuck comes by on this Sunday morning, I'm going to say, great. I have Pastor Stan doing the next service. I'll go to brunch with you. <laughs> sure enough, he comes up, and, and I just uh, watched him walk up. And Pastor Mark, we're going to brunch at the Stony Brook Golf Club. You want to join us? He's already got this grin on his face. I say, you know, I can this morning. <laughs> We've got one of the other pastors say, he got his eyes, got his face. Like, Come on! And we went and we had a, a great brunch. But I remember seeing everything at that wonderful country club and not knowing where to start. I mean, where do you start when you're hungry with a brunch? You, do, you don't want to be like a, you know, a hog and load your plate up. Then you get all these things going in your head. Should I be healthy and eat the fruit? and the salad, and if I ever start making any move towards the biscuits and gravy, I know my wife's going to be after me and tell me that that's not good for me. I'm, I'm telling you all this food stuff because the lessons that we have this morning are like this incredible smorgasbord. They're like Easter brunch. Uh, you, you like everything, and where, where do you go with the lessons today? We talk about the greatest conversion story there is. Saul to Paul. Do, do, do we look at that um, psalm lesson, which is this incredible uh, praising of God, restoring health and not letting death be victorious over us? Uh, do we uh, run with the revelation text, which is a, a hymn of praise? It tells us the perpetual praise that will never, ever cease for the lamb who was slain is now on the throne. And how the creatures in heaven are unceasingly circling the throne with the amens and the amens. And then two stories in the gospel. Great fishing story. It's tempting to run with the fishing story. Uh, my dad always liked that because he was a Norwegian and ate fish for breakfast. Uh, or the lamb story. Feed my sheep. I mean, there's a smorgasbord. But you have to decide or you're going to be hungry. And so here's how I've decided and the food for your 
your spiritual well-being that I'd like to lay before you this morning. And it's some conversation about conversion and, and revival. And I have two outcomes or things that I would like to uh, have happen with you as I, I talk about this. And, and the first is this. I'd, I'd like you to hear the invitation that's given to all believers to pray for conversion, to pray for revival, uh, not just in your own life, but generally for our country and our world. Outcome number one that I'm, I'm hoping for and asking God to uh, let happen in your life. Uh, outcome number two is uh, I'd love for you this week with somebody that you're very uh, confident uh, with in, in love. It might be a, a spouse. It might be a uh, you know, a, a confident brother or sister in Christ. I'd like you to take the time uh, to talk about uh, your spiritual development and maybe uh, talk and share a little bit uh, about a, a place in which you really knew uh, God was working, forming, shaping, speaking to you. Do you have the two outcomes? Praying about conversion and revival. Secondly, uh, engaging somebody in a conversation or dialogue back and forth about your own conversion and your own periods of life. Let's talk about Paul just for a few moments. There's, uh, th this is the conversion of all conversions. Uh, the, the Damascus Road to conversion. The Apostle Paul has been a persecutor of the church. He does not want and will do almost anything to prevent the message of the resurrection spreading. And that is the nature of the high priest and the religious community following the time of the resurrection. Remember the disciples last week? They're all locked in an upper room. They're scared to death. Why? They're going to get hunted. They're going to get arrested. They might get crucified the way Jesus was crucified because the message that they were speaking was not acceptable. Paul or Saul has gone to the high priests of the day and he's got arrest warrant letters. And so he's already captured some people in Jerusalem but he's got a trip now to Damascus, and he doesn't want the message to spread to Damascus. Damascus is 150 miles away, four to six day walk. And they don't want the message to get there. Do you know what? This might come as a real revelation to you. There was no email at the time. <laughs> the only way the word would get there is if somebody brought it. And they believed they could stop it. See, if it got to Damascus, guess what would happen? It was a great trading center, east and west, north and south. Then the message would what? It would go all over, and they could not stop it. So this is a, is a critical thing. Uh, but these early Christians knew that they were sent into the world. And they gathered and prayed about this, that the world would be converted, changed, that there would be a revival that would take place, that the Holy Spirit would give. And so we have Paul in this journey, and this incredible thing happens. Uh, he's uh, shocked by light. He falls off his horse. If you've been watching the Bible on TV, have any of you been watching that? It goes right off a horse. Just like Father Brooks when he was in Scotland. I don't know. He was converted long before that. Fell off a horse and did what? Broke his arm. <laughs> He's blinded. But then he hears the voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Who are you, Lord? I am what? Jesus. I've got a different plan for you. Uh, you'll go to Damascus. Then God has a, an instrument by the name of Ananias who will serve him. And Ananias' growth in faith is as important as Saul's. Saul's is the dramatic one, but I, I want to make a connection for you that your conversion, your revival, is equally as important as Saul because we're all to be instruments of God sent in to the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here is one thing that I know absolutely for sure, as I have done some study of conversion and revival. It is always, 100% of the time, preceded by fervent, regular prayer. You can always trace conversion and revival to people who have gathered together that have fervently and persistently prayed that the Holy Spirit would bring this kind of change. That was true for Saul's case. It's almost always true in all of the other conversions that, that we can study. Let, let me just tick off a couple really quick. Ever hear of Augustine? One of the great early church fathers, guess what? He was a wild kid. But guess what? He had a mom named Monica, and guess what? Monica never, ever quit praying for her wayward child. What happens? He's converted, and he becomes one of the greatest explainers and apologists of the early Christian church. His, his writings still give formation. Do you see why I'm inviting you to pray? <laughs> Let that be a regular part of, of, of your life when we do. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, honors that. Uh, let, let me just tick off some others. Do you remember C.S. Lewis? You know, closer to our time. An atheist. Guess what? There was a group of people that prayed for him. You know what happened? He was converted to the Christian faith. And his writings have had just enormous, enormous uh, implications for other people becoming Christians. Do you know the story of Billy Graham? Uh, he was in buying a pair of shoes one day. And a guy not by the name of Ananias, the one whose name we can hardly remember, shared with him the gospel story. And it started a conversion process in his life. And think of all of the people that God has uh, used Billy Graham to help in a life of faith. Uh, Prayer preceding conversion and revival. I'm just building a case that as you uh, pray, uh, remember how important that, that prayer is uh, in our whole Christian uh, experience. Uh, secondly, another little sub point here is you know, God blesses uh, the world with seasons of, of revival where. Uh, culture or, or nationalism for some reason, and it's not totally understandable as you study these uh, periods in, in Christian history, why, why it takes place. It's because the Holy Spirit is, is mysterious. But there are seasons of grace, great awakenings. Uh, they can be designated and seen. Uh, there's a, a period known as the Welsh Revival uh, in, in the British Isles, where people just started listening to the preachers. And it started to make sense, not because they got any better at it or really were doing anything different, but people were praying for conversion and, and revival, and hearts became more uh, open and, and receptive. 
I, 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 I uh, had a period of studying that part of uh, revivalism. And it, it was so interesting. Uh, there was lots of coal mining. And, you know, they used donkeys and mules to haul stuff up out of the mines. And uh, before the revival, the language and the behavior of the miners was, was really terrible. And they'd swear and they'd curse at their donkeys and jackasses. And when they became Christians, they cleaned up their language, and guess what? The donkeys and jackasses didn't know how to respond to the new commands <laughs> that didn't have the profanity <laughs> with it. Uh, talk about change. Uh, wouldn't it be, this is a part of, you know, where Mark's heart is. I, I pray lots. I would so love to know that uh, in, in the time I have here on earth, I've been able to see one of these periods of history where hearts are open and where the spirit is moving in such a way that lives are transformed. Wouldn't that be great? Uh, in your prayers, Pray for conversion and revival. But secondly, here's the other outcome. Do you know God works with you and your conversion might not be falling off a horse and getting stuck blind? I bet you've had some really neat times where the word has been more clear than it ever was before. I'll, I'll bet God has uh, led you through some difficult periods and, and that's a part of conversion and revival as well. And today, I, I just, uh, you know, we're, we're rejoicing in Christ's victory over death, but we're rejoicing as well uh, that when the message comes to us, it does something and it inspires us. And may you be inspired with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit this day. May the words of our hearts, the meditations of our mouths be acceptable in your sight, O good and gracious God. Amen. Amen.